This video is about antiarrhythmic drugs and how they work on the heart. So we'll begin by reminding ourselves how a normal action potential works. So these cells rest at about negative 85 millivolts. Phase zero begins as a rapid upstroke created by voltage-gated sodium channels. This is a very fast phase. This is followed by the inactivation of these voltage-gated sodium channels and the activation of the calcium and potassium channels, creating this plateau phase. This is followed by a rapid repolarization with the potassium rectifier current. Once it's back to resting potential, it's ready to release a new action potential. So antiarrhythmics work on the heart by changing the shape of this action potential. We'll start by talking about class 1, one antiarrhythmic. These are local anaesthetics that slow or block the conduction by acting on the fast sodium channels and these prevent a new action potential from happening by preventing the opening of these voltage gated sodium channels. This lengthens the action potential and increases the action potential duration causing the graph to look somewhat like this. As long as one action potential is underway, a new one can't begin, so in this way it decreases the firing rate. Drugs that act in this way block a certain formation of the sodium channel. They block it in the open state and therefore they're called the class 1A channel blockers. A different kind of antiarrhythmics called class 1B block the fast sodium channels in their inactive or refractory state. This shortens the duration of an action potential and increases the time between action potentials. So this is particularly good for cells that have suffered ischemic damage. The clever thing about this is it selectively binds to cells that have been depolarized and are in their inactive state. So this is the ideal first line treatment for preventing post MI arrhythmias. An example of a one class 1B drug is lidocaine, which incidentally is also the least toxic of all the antiarrhythmics. Class 1C antiarrhythmics block the sodium channel in any formation, so they're not very selective and are only used when class 1As and 1Bs don't work. And because they block all kinds of sodium channels, it doesn't affect the action potential duration because obviously it pulls in both directions, so the net result is nothing. So examples of class 1A drugs are quinidine, procainamide and disopyramide. Quinidine is widely used in AF because it increases the action potential duration and increases effective refractory period and also it selectively binds to cells that are frequently depolarized so it allows the, the atria to realign with the ventricular contractions. But because quinidine also has muscarinic effects, and by blocking these muscarinic receptors, it can also increase your heart rate and precip precipitate reflex tachycardia. And because of this, you always want to give digoxin with quinidine to block the AV node and prevent this from running through the AV node and causing ventricular tachycardia. As mentioned before, an example of a class 1B drug is lidocaine, which is ideal for use in post-MI or ischemic tissue because it gives the ischemic and damaged cells a chance to catch up with the healthy surrounding tissue. Examples of class 1C drugs are flecainide and propafenon. These are mostly used when all other antiarrhythmics have failed to work and they often come into play when you have a ventricular tachycardia that might progress to ventricular fibrillation. But as we mentioned, it's a last resort drug, though it does sometimes work when everything else has failed. So that's class 1 antiarrhythmics, sodium channel blockers. So class 2 antiarrhythmics are beta blockers. These are metoprolol, propanolol, esmolol, atenolol, timolol, so all the lols. They work by decreasing sinoatrial and AV node activity. So we'll just remind ourselves how beta blockers work. So here you've got your nodal cell, and here's our beta-1 receptor. These are G-protein couples, which activate adenocyclase, which increased cyclic AMP within the cell. 
And cyclic AMP in turn activates protein kinase A, which goes ahead and phosphorylates all the channels. So the channels relevant to us now are the sodium channel, the potassium channel, and the calcium channel. So all of these become phosphorylated by pKa. As a result of the phosphorylation, the sodium channel opens, the potassium channel is closed, and the calcium channel is opened. So this leads to an influx of sodium and an influx of calcium, rapidly depolarizing the cell and accelerating the action potential. So it looks something like this. Say this is our normal action potential. Stimulation of the beta receptor causes the action potential to speed up in this way. So we take advantage of this, and in antiarrhythmic beta blockers, we block the beta, beta receptor, and this causes it to flatten this way, thus decreasing the heart rate. So that's how beta blockers work, and they're used in ventricular tachycardias, and to slow ventricular filling during atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Now the important thing to remember is to not use beta blockers in asthmatics and patients with COPD. Also, they should be used with care in diabetics because beta blockers can mask the signs of hypoglycemia. Next, we've got our class 3 antiarrhythmics. These are potassium channel blockers and drugs are amiodarone, ibutilide, dofetilide and sotalol. These can be helpfully remembered with the mnemonic AIDS. A -I -D -S. So if you'll remember, we said our normal action potential looked like this. And if you'll remember, we said potassium channels open here and are responsible for this downward curve. Obviously, if you've blocked these potassium channels, it will take longer for it to come back down, and thus they'll look something like this. This delayed rectifier current will be even more delayed, and potassium will be forced to exit the cell slower. Now this too increases the action potential duration and the effective refractory period, thus increasing the length of time between each action potential. Now the thing to be careful about with class 3 antiarrhythmics is that sotalol, for example, can cause torsade du pont, which is where on an ECG you see a really messy ventricular tachycardia. Unlike the classic ventricular tachycardia where uh, the waveforms are pretty monomorphic. In torsades, the waveforms are polymorphic and they just look really messy. This is dangerous because it can precipitate uh, ventricular fibrillation, so you treat this with magnesium sulfate. Finally, we've got our class 4 antiarrhythmics, which are calcium channel blockers. These include rapamil and diltiazem. These slow down the already slow calcium channels and thus decrease the conduction velocity, increasing the effective refractory period and also the PR interval. Calcium channel blockers like verapamil and diltiazem are mostly used um, to prevent nodal arrhythmias because those are the most cardioselective of all the calcium channel blockers. So in quick summary, you've got the class 1 antiarrhythmics, which are the fast sodium channel blockers. The 1As increase the action potential duration. 1b, such as lidocaine, decrease it, and 1c has no effect whatsoever on the action potential duration. Class 2 antiarrhythmics are our beta blockers, which are metoprolol and protanolol and the likes. Class 3 are our potassium channel blockers, such as amiodarone, and, and finally class 4, which are calcium channel blockers, such as verapamil. So I hope that made quite a confusing topic a little bit clearer.